And welcome to SEC Sports Roundtable. This is your host, Shane Bailey, back for episode number 70, it looks like, if my math is correct, for our roundtable. Have with me tonight, Drew Young. Welcome, Drew. What's up, Shaner? Good day to be a Kentucky fan. We'll get into a little bit of that a little bit later. I know it's all, it always circles back to Kentucky for you, doesn't it? Yes, you know that's always. You need to be you need to be unbiased like me. I I don't I don't only report I report just whatever the news is. Just the facts, right? Yep. That's but me. the grass is always bluer in Kentucky. Yeah. And also with us tonight, Blair Smiley. Welcome, Blair. It's good to be back, guys. Glad to have you. I know it's been a couple weeks for you, and about a week, not quite at two weeks for us for the roundtable. Um, trying to space it out a little bit longer uh, in this lower season. We're not talking a lot of football, but uh, I think there's a little football to talk now. So we're definitely uh, right off the heels of National si Letter of Intent Signing Day, uh, which occurred yesterday. So we're uh, going to talk a little football. I think most of our programs have something to be be proud about uh, in the SEC. Uh, you know, we'll talk a little basketball, I guess, towards the end. Uh, as well, since we're right in the heart of SEC action as far as the basketball season goes. But, uh, Blair, I'll let you just lead us off. You're the uh, – you, you and Drew probably uh, are one of are the two I'm going to rely on most with, with all the names of the individuals. Um, what's What happened down in Mississippi down there? Were you happy with the way Mississippi State ended up shaking out, or, or is it paled in comparison to the guys uh, neighboring to you? Uh, I'm really excited about what Mississippi State did, but I think if you are looking from a national uh, standpoint, I think Ole Miss stole the day yesterday. I mean, they had a phenomenal class. Um, and, you know, it's one of those deals where, you know, they've kind of gotten a lot of heat um, about it. Um, and I'd like to hear what your views are uh, with regards to it. But uh, I think they had a little bit of luck on their side with regards to some inroads on um, you know, the Kim Dietschy with the brother being there, and then the Treadwell, which is the wide receiver out of Chicago. Um, you know, Hugh Freeze was able to throw his best friend a scholarship last year, filling out his class, and it kind of gave him an inside track to him. And, you know, and I, I think what you're seeing is, um, you know, these all-star games and those types of things, if you've got an established player like a Kim Dietschy that's been around on the recruiting scene for two years as the most dominant player in that class, um, you can you can pick up some steam, and Hugh Freeze and them did I think a, about as good a job as anybody can with, you know I would say is their best class um, going down there. But uh, I know that Mississippi was in the the headlines there for the last four days with the Chris Houston. I mean the kid from Houston, Mississippi, the Chris Jones defensive defensive end that we were able to actually hang on. So. I'm really excited with Mississippi State did to be consensus top 25 class with 21 commits or 21 signees um, and being the top 25 again and second year in a row, I think it's been uh, pretty solid. We've got some definitely got some needs. Yeah, uh, I mean, Ole Miss gave it everything they had to get, get your uh, get your boy out of Houston, and, and I guess it was just too strong because you were talking about that just a couple of weeks ago. On the podcast, I mean, Mississippi State was was looking at him well before, uh, you know, his his rankings were what barely a three star when they first started putting eyes on him. And yeah, you know, that's a it's a very rare situation. And Drew, I don't know if you followed it at all or really knew about it, but you know, listening to Barton Simmons this week talk about him, you know, six months ago nobody knew who he was. They had no tape on him. Um, it's a strange situation where he moved. Um, the summer before his junior year, and because he moved past the deadline, he only got to play six games. He was suspended for the first six games. So I guess everybody, nobody had any tape on him. They thought that his, I guess his junior stats were a full season um, when he ideally only played half a season. So um, really, really strange for him to vault up, you know, in 24-7 as the number two prospect. He's the by far the highest rated player that Mississippi State's ever um, ever recruited and, and landed and really, really a freak athlete. They're, you know, hearing Barton Simmons talk about a kid that's 6'7", 260 pounds with a frame of a Julius Peppers gets your attention really quick. Um, you know, so he, he's a difference maker and, 
you know, for Ole Miss and Mississippi State to basically uh, land the, the top three consensus national players um, is, you know, kind of a rare deal. So um, it, it's kind of interesting from that standpoint, but I think some, some serious program changers, um, you know, from that standpoint. So landing him made our class um, that much better, but it definitely held off the kind of the steam of what Ole Miss was was doing there, and I think he was, yeah, you know, he was kind of caught up in that. And luckily for us, he stayed with us. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you're going to know a lot more about it than I am. I, I, I saw Rivals, uh, Rivals shot him up the list. I mean, I think he was like a hundred and something hundred. I mean, even like they they did rank rate him, and they I think they had him as like a four star or something like that. Yeah. He went from like 135 to the number 20 prospect in the country. So yeah. when you're talking about, you know, top 20 or top 50 in the country, it doesn't matter what site you're talking about. Um, you're a player. So <clears throat> yeah, I mean, he looks like the real deal. I mean, it's just hard. The tough thing about recruiting uh, is, I mean, who would you say if you're going to start a team in college football, uh, who are you going to take? Johnny Manziel? I mean, that's who I'm looking at. Yeah. And he was a three-star. And uh, you, you look at his tape. I mean, I looked at his tape, uh, his high school tape, and he looks good, but, you know, you just you never know how somebody's going to work out. And and uh, I think you just have to do the best you can. And you you kind of – it's it's almost like a, a spray, and, uh, spray and pray type method, but, you know, the better athletes that you get. I mean, of course, if, you, if you're like a, a Alabama and you can get a bunch of, a bunch of five-stars – more than likely, a handful of them are going to turn out. So, I mean, that's all you really have to have when you're you're getting five or six of them every year. So, yeah, you know, I I think the other thing that goes on here, guys, is is really what the SEC did yesterday. Um, you know, I, I just look at it from a Mississippi State standpoint. You're a consensus top twenty-five class, and we are ninth or tenth in the SEC, um, pretty much across whatever scouting um, place you look, and so. For a Kentucky, you know, in one of the in one of the rankings, they're 28th, I believe, or something, 28, 29th in the top 30 um, for the first time in a long time, and they're 13th. Um, and so it just kind of you know goes to show you that the SEC basically showed their power yesterday, really unlike any time they've done in the past. Um, I want to say in the West, five of the what five of the seven teams were in the top 15, if I'm not mistaken, top, top 11 or something. So it's really, really dominant from that standpoint. And to put it in perspective, you know, seeing a Twitter yesterday, uh, a tweet yesterday that said that um, the Big 12 conference as a whole signed 12 top 300 players off of ESPN's top 300, Ole Miss signed 10. I mean, that's a mind-boggling number uh, when you're talking about, you know, I think 31 of the top 50 players on ESPN's top 50 are going to play in the SEC next year. Um, so it's just amazing. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. Unless you were thinking about Tennessee, I mean, everybody picked an SEC school except for the guys that Tennessee was in at the end, and they, you know, go to Michigan and, uh, and Ohio, Ohio State. State. So. So that's kind of the way it goes. I mean, it's so funny, though, and I'll, I'll turn this into Tennessee because that's what I always talk about. It's it's the greatest time to be in the SEC. And the boom – I mean, look who the boom's helping. Obviously, it's helping uh, Alabama and Auburn and LSU and South Carolina and Georgia and Mississippi State and Ole Miss and Vanderbilt and, and, and Kentucky even just in this recruiting, but not really Kentucky as much. You know, what are the – there's one team really that that's, you know – on the crap list right now, and it's Tennessee. It's just unbelievable how everybody in the SEC is happy. Tennessee's got a you know a, a number twenty or number twenty two, number twenty five ranked class. You're ecstatic with that, and and Tennessee fans like me, I, I feel like this is the the worst thing that's ever happened. Well, I think if you take a look, Drew, you know I was just looking at this. You look at Alabama; they got, it, and I'm looking at twenty four sevens composite uh, ranking because I, I like to take that just because it it encapsulates all all of the uh, recruiting sites, you know, Alabama signs 18 kids that are, that are four star or higher. Um, LSU has 19 four stars. Um, you know, Texas A&M has 15 four stars and up. Um, it's just amazing. Georgia has 14 and up. And then you have Mississippi state, you know, that's got five 
on Ole Miss that this year has 10, but normally they're going to be in that five range. South Carolina has seven. Tennessee has four. And so it's one of those deals where I think Tennessee, it's, I don't know, I, you got to be frustrated as a Tennessee fan because basically Derek Dooley's staff laid down and you got to be happy with the inroads that Jones made, but he just, he just didn't have any time. Um, but to get a Joshua Dobbs, uh, I, I think it's going to be a great player to get the um, wide receiver North. Yeah. I think the impact player, but I mean, to miss the miss the bell kid and, and uh, those guys, it's just tough, man, because you got, you got to basically bank on everything being there the next year. Since the night before uh, signing day, I mean, around here in Nashville, Bell was basically going to Tennessee, and he decided, I guess, at the last second not to do that. Well, I mean, it. it yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing is even Bruce Feldman tweeted out. It's, yeah. It just it just shows you the Tennessee the, where Tennessee is right now. When you have when you have guys like Bruce Feldman, who's a very reputable source tweeting out that Tennessee signs uh, Von Bell and it didn't happen. I mean, that, that doesn't happen in other schools. I mean, that's just the way Tennessee's luck is right now um, is, is kind of what you feel like. But, but, but yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be tough right now. And, and the Bells are trying to blame this all on Dooley. They're, they're putting it on him saying he didn't, uh, he didn't recruit him and, and he was, you know, late calling him and didn't, didn't communicate with him, which, on one hand, I understand that, and I guess if you're an 18-year-old kid, you want to get shown love for a long time. But but who the hell cares what Dooley did to you when when he's not the coach anymore? If you yeah. like if you like Butch Jones, don't don't cop out on the old coach. The old coach is gone. It doesn't matter what Joker Phillips did or, or Derek Dooley did or Gene Chizik did. It matters what what you feel like you where you fit in with with uh, Gus Malzahn or Butch Jones or or, uh, or Stoops. I mean. It's just tough. I mean, you're dealing with 18-year-old kids, and, and and yeah, why would you not go to Ohio State uh, over Tennessee? I mean, that's the problem is Tennessee recruits against – they have to – every battle is always going to be against an Ohio State or a, or a USC or a, or a Florida because that's where they have to recruit. They, you know, they haven't got those borders around Tennessee where they're getting the, the – uh, what's the kid's name? We just talked about him, Jalen uh, – Ramsey. Jalen Ramsey, or the uh, the you know the the run the Christian Morris from from Memphis, or the Jordan Wilkins. I mean, there's a ton of talent at Tennessee this year. It's just the problem that these kids don't know Tennessee as a winning program, and and you know it, it really. If there's one team, I mean, if there's one team that's kind of hurting from the SEC being up so much, it's Tennessee because yeah. you know they're they're about the same as they used to be. They just I mean, their schedule's so hard every year, and until they start winning games on the field, I just think it's going to be tough to win these recruiting battles. Well, I, you talk about, you know, how much Butch Jones is bringing to the Tennessee program, but if you look at rivals, it's just a, a gauge there. You know, in 11, you were 13th. Uh, in 12, you were 17th. And this year, you're 20th. So, you know, Butch Jones didn't provide that, that spark that you really needed because you didn't need to lose any more ground right, in those rankings, I, at least I think. Well, I think I think the other thing that you got to take into consideration is, um, I think you got to take into consideration that he had to make up a lot more ground than you normally have to do in a transition. Um, I really believe that. But the other thing is, is that if you're Tennessee, if I'm a Tennessee fan, I basically go, I got to take the positive of the inroads that he made, the the impact that he's putting on in the state getting into Memphis, getting into Nashville that Tennessee really hasn't done for the last five or six years. And if you look at the state of Tennessee, really, really good talent next year that's going to be on the board. Um, you got to make your hay. And so you've got to have an Ole Miss type of class next year. You've got to have a program changing class um, where you come in and you get in that top eight. And Tennessee can do that um, because of the in-state talent that's in, out there next year and the, kind of the high end. Um, but you got to make sure that those guys actually get it done. And it, it's a little bit frustrating, I think. So I think the thing that kills Tennessee fans is Von Bell was a guy that you needed in the secondary. <laughs> and and you got nothing in the secondary. And that, that was a blatantly big weakness from last year with no speed, and, and you really didn't get any options there. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, I think it's it's one of those things, though. The tough thing is you look at these rankings, and if you go based, I think you're you're on to something there, Blair. When you if you really dig into it, Tennessee signed uh, they signed one running back that's still not even qualified yet. Um, and they didn't sign a ton on the defensive line. They didn't sign a ton in the secondary. I mean, they have a couple guys, but that was their weak spots. The problem with the rankings are, let's say Von Bell does commit to Tennessee, and let's say they get one other. Let's say they, they got that running back. I mean, yeah, that's two guys, and they could help, but that would have taken Tennessee from number 20th to number 10. Fourth. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, it, it, you gain so much, especially when Tennessee only signed 21. So uh, I think – I mean, just think – I mean, same thing Mississippi State with regards to Mackenzie Alexander, you know, the, the five-star kid that ended up going to Clemson. He pulls the Mississippi State hat out, um, and nobody knew where he was going. You know, you get one five-star, it, it changes everything. So, I mean, that's why I sit there and I think that – I mean, I think Tennessee's in the position now where they need to make a, a big move. And, and, and the, the chatter right now, of course, is what about like a Michael Dyer or uh, Isaiah Crowell, you know, take a chance on one of those guys. And I, I don't I don't necessarily think it's a bad idea. I mean, wh I don't know what you have to lose, really. I mean, getting a guy, especially like a Dyer, I mean, he'd come in and play right away. But yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting. I, I mean, I'd hate to see um, – I I'd be frustrated as a Tennessee fan, especially with seeing the haul and the, the, the recruiting that happened this year. Um, it's, you know, missing that one guy was, was big and critical. But uh, um, I'm interested to see what they're going to do following that year. You know, kind of, you know, do they do what a Hugh Freeze did where he kind of came in and was able to fill out a class, but it wasn't really anything special and then obviously worked a whole year. Well, I, uh, I think what you said earlier, Tennessee's got to have a big year next year, and they're already off to a pretty good start. They've got uh, they've got one or two guys committed already, and and they've got it's a weird situation. It's a big legacy class for Tennessee. Yeah, there's a uh, you know Bill Bates' son, and he's been to Tennessee a bunch, and you've got uh, and you've got uh, a Wharton kid who's you know uncle played basketball there, and uh, Todd Kelly Jr. is a big name player. Eric Berry's two brothers, you know, are on the radar, and, and I know they're not as highly ranked as uh, uh, as as Eric Berry was, but I can assure you, man, those kids will be able to play just because, yeah. I mean, they, they got in their blood, and if they can get those type guys to come in, um, especially if they can get them to commit early, then they'll just, yeah. you know, that's, that's you know, start with four, you know, four four stars before summer, and, and you know, it's just going to be a completely different type of class, so. Yeah, if you get people like Jalen Hurd. Yeah, and Jalen Hurd would be a great, I mean, that's a good, a uh, good guy. They got a lot of ground to make up with him. Ohio State's on him, and you know the crybaby Urban Meyer. That's what I love. He's over there whining and complaining. You know, there's no way Tennessee can be recruiting against us. They've got to be doing something. And then he, you know, he he cries his way to you know to Von Bell signing with them. So, congrats, buddy. Go have a heart attack. <laughs> I love it. So, I mean, do, do y'all have any uh, – I mean, obviously Ole Miss was a winner. I mean, is there any other classes out there that you thought, you know well, – I mean, obviously I've, Alabama, I've got Florida. A yeah, I would say Alabama's a winner. Here's why they're a winner. They get they get running backs. They've got uh, they've got T.J. Yeldon at running back who's going to be a sophomore next year. So, he's going to be there for two more years. Um, and that's right. And they yeah. – and not to mention they've got Derrick Henry – committed, and they've got that uh, ten penny kid committed, and they've got another running back committed. And then Alvin Kamara, he's like, well, you know, I want to play running back, but I'll go to Alabama and play linebacker because I'll just go to Alabama. Yeah. I mean, well, it's just incredible to me, these kids that – I mean, I, I think Alabama's been very lucky that the system's kind of worked for them, and they've had – that maybe the system does work where they've been able to have a uh, – Mark Ingram and a Trent Richardson, and now you know Lacey and Yeldon. Maybe they can just have every year get a running back. I, I don't know. I just at some point some of these kids are gonna. I mean, it used to be that you just didn't sign three running backs because they didn't want to compete against each other. But now apparently at Alabama they they just don't care. But the problem is they're all going pro, and so you know if you want to look at it that way, all these kids are thinking about is a paycheck, and so if that means they might have to set a year or two, but they're still going to go to the pros. Does it really matter to them? Because they, because they probably might sit a year and still end up with a ring on their hand and go pro. It should. They they need to be more competitive. They're they're they don't need to be sitting. They need to be playing as freshmen. 
That's right. I think I think Auburn had a fantastic close uh, to theirs, which I mean, with Alabama and what they were doing in the state, and as far away as Auburn was, I mean, I think they had a really good close, and um, you know, it's one of those deals where you know Vanderbilt had a you know solid top twenty class, top twenty five class, and South Carolina probably had the quietest top fifteen class. Um, so. It's pretty interesting how the SEC just completely dominated this year, um, you know, with regards to it. And um, there's a lot of things going on, you know, from that standpoint. And I think I saw where the the kids that actually um, signed this year, the last time, last time a team other than the SEC won, they were in the fifth grade. So. So what do you think about the allegations that are going on now for Ole Miss being che uh, cheating with all of this? Now, oh, let me let me ask this. This is a good time to say this, uh, Blair. Tell, talk a little bit about Chad Bumpus's tweet that he had out there. I, it was kind of interesting. He put it out there, and I think he was, uh, I think he was just kind of stirring the pot. Um, but basically, he put a tweet out there that um, to all the recruits, you know, make sure that um, you don't take the money because. Once you take the money, um, you got to be there. You still got to go to school. You got to be there for three or five years. So definitely go to a place that you want to be at. And a lot of people took it differently. Some people took it as Mississippi State paid him, and then some took it as he was throwing a jab at Ole Miss. And I think I think that's kind of what they were doing. I think he was trying to get into people's skin. And after the end of the day, he actually did an interview where he, he essentially said that, he was offered money by other schools. He would not name who the schools were, but he was not offered money by Mississippi State. But he went to state and didn't regret anything other than he wished they had run the score up uh, on Ole Miss in his junior year. But other than that, he said that's about the only thing he regretted. Let, let me tell you this. I, I have no doubt that Chad Bumpus was paid money to go to Mississippi State. I have no doubt that Ole Miss is paying people money. You just don't say something like that. And and uh, look at all the recruiting uh, pictures that came out. Uh, who did they? Who oh, at Ole Miss? Uh, Davin Bellamy um, up in Oregon where he's, yeah, sitting there, he's sitting there. He's got a bong on the table and, and you know, five white girls, you know, <laughs> sitting around him. And then uh, the Treadwell kid at Ole Miss. Is it Treadwell or Treadwell? I can't remember. Yeah, uh, Treadwell. He's, yeah. got, he's got just stacks of cash, you know, sitting beside him. I mean, there's just no doubt. I mean, these kids are – everybody's cheating. It's like steroids. I'm telling you, in about four or five years, you're going to figure out that everybody's cheating, probably except Tennessee because they can't get any players. That's, that's my thought, at least. That's what I got in my head. But, I mean, it's just – it's ridiculous. I mean, these kids open their mouth, and I'm telling you, there's – you just don't – I mean, I don't think Chad Bumps is smart enough to make that good of a – like a – a witty joke. I mean, he probably got paid, and 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 just like I'm, Ole Miss is paying people to come to school there too. I mean, you just don't have a, a number seven ranked class when you're Ole Miss. I mean, they they used to be crap, and all of a sudden now, uh, the the blindside coach is 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 dominating and recruiting after one year. I just I don't get that unless you're unless you're doing something under the table, and the whole Cam Newton stuff. I mean, all that stuff. There, where there's smoke, there's got to be fire with this stuff. Well, the Cam Newton, I mean, I think we can all basically, uh, uh, you know, we can kind of come to a conclusion. When you pay a kid, they actually own you. So what happened with Auburn two years later? Basically, all the guys laid down. So Gene Chizik got a national championship and got a nice walkaway bonus. <clears throat> it was worth it. They were all in. Yeah, but I mean, look at it. I mean, there's allegations that Mississippi State offered him money too. I'm, I'm not saying I'm not trying yeah. to dog Mississippi yeah. State. I'm I'm just saying that there more than likely is some blue chips type stuff going on, and people are getting paid. I mean, that's just and and it makes sense. I mean, all these it's probably except for Alabama. Alabama just doesn't have to pay anybody, I and mean, they can run it clean because they get paid in the NFL because everybody they touch turns to gold and gets drafted. So. Well, I mean, it's just uh, the problem really stem from the NCAA and their just un inability to to handle this correctly. I mean, look what they've done down in Miami. I mean, you talk about just a shipwreck down there. Yeah, I mean, you, you get Yahoo basically hands it to them on a silver platter and just basically tells you don't screw it up, and they screw it up. Yeah, I mean, um, Pero basically did everything that Yahoo said he did, but yet. Miami's basically getting off with not going to the bowl this year, and that's all they're going to get for all of that. 
Yeah. Well, it goes to show you that you can pay players and you can do all this underhanded stuff, but what you can't do is have a barbecue and lie to the NCAA. So. Just don't lie. You can you can cheat all you want. Just yeah. Don't. You can take ACTs for people, but just don't have. Is that, are you trying is to? It, are you trying to segue over into the basketball talk? That's it. I'm trying to say John Calipari is a much smarter cheater than Bruce Pearl was. <laughs> And now Tennessee's stuck with a coach that runs the most boring offense, if you can even call it offense. Of, I mean, it's well, scoring uh, it, in, in general is just awful this year. Well, you know the thing, you know, Drew. I don't have. I, you know, I'll be honest with you guys. You know, I play basketball, and college. We can get on a whole other topic about college basketball that I have a whole soapbox on right now um, because it's basically. It's the destruction of AAU basketball, um, and I can just go on for days. Basically, it's more about the number of games you play than actually the fundamentals. So kids can't shoot, they can't pass, they can't do anything. That's why John Calipari wins because he's got a dribble-drive offense that basically says, hey, you just drive it because that's all you know how to do and react. Um, but I'm watching Tennessee-Georgia last night, and it – do what? He's able to coach with what's out there. He's taking the what those players are able to do and make the best out of it. Sure. Um, basically, I'm watching Tennessee Georgia last night, and you tell me this, Drew. Am I correct? Caldwell Pope or whatever his freaking name is. Yeah. Do you know what the point differential is between his points per game and the second leading scorer on Georgia's team is? I have no idea. It's over ten points a game the differential between how many points he scores and the next leading score. How in the world do you allow that kid to, you know, yeah, he made tough shots, but you can't let him have the ball. <coughs> let somebody else win. Let somebody have the ball. I, I didn't understand it. And, I mean, and I know you miss Maven, and I know he helps you bring the ball up, and he's a point forward. And I think he did a lot of things for you, man. But good gravy. Well, I think it's tough. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think the the reason that John Calipari has been winning with Kentucky and the reason they're not as good this year is because they've had the best point guard in the nation in the last, like, five years. And right now with college basketball and creating and, and not having those shooters, the teams that have those point guards are really, really at an advantage. And Tennessee is, is playing point guard right now. They have two options, or they've got about three options, actually. Option number one is Trey Golden, who's a two-guard, um, is – no more point guard than you are, Blair. Yeah. Um, option number two uh, is it was Jordan McRae, and they actually was probably better with that. And he's like a two slash three player that can't even handle the ball and turns it over too much. So they had to take him out. Well, who are they using now? They're using a kid named Lopez. It's a walk on. How yeah. in the world does the University of Tennessee have to have a walk on as their point guard? And it's okay if a walk on's good, but he's not good. So right. they've got. I just don't understand how. That's what I tweeted out earlier. If Aaron Kraft had a just, you know, if Tennessee could have held on to Aaron Kraft, then one, they'd have, you know, a top five point guard in the nation, and two, they'd still have, you know, a top ten coach in the nation too because yes. I'm sure that stuff wouldn't have leaked out. I'm like, damn, man, that was just – that was close. I mean, they could have they could have kept him and it would have been, they'd have been fine. But it, that's what I think Tennessee, their glaring problem is, is not only – yeah. Uh, losing uh, Maimon Hurts, but the other factor is they have no point guard. And guess what, Blair? They didn't sign one in this class either. So, you know, that's the problem with, with Tennessee is they keep getting these five-star kids that play the four and, you know, they're slashers. But without somebody to run your offense, then you're kind of in trouble. Anything? Um I'm just looking at the schedule because I was thinking that Kentucky had Florida next, and I was a little. It just hit me that, you know, I, I'd hate to see Florida right after a loss, but I just noticed that it's Auburn, so I'm feeling a little better right now. Yeah, we got Florida. Okay, sorry for your sorry. We'll we'll, we'll take that thirty point drubbing for you. Get them warmed up. So it's, it's I know they've got Florida coming up twice and and once pretty soon here. Um, well, Drew, you could be, um, you know, you talk about a starting point guard that's a walk-on. Um, Mississippi State has a walk-on that averages 20, 20 minutes a game. And two years ago, 
he actually was basically playing against the girls' basketball team as a scrub practice player. So we have like seven bodies, but I like our coach. Well, and that's just kind of – you all are hinting to some of the problems that, that the SEC in general has with their basketball program. I mean, how, how does – when we talked about this, I think me and you, Drew, last week, what how many teams are going to be able to make the tournament? And – when you have that week of, of, of recruiting and, and depth on your program, it doesn't take, you know, a couple more of those teams to happen. Uh, you don't have to a team that, that was pretty good to have those down years, and all of a sudden, you're going to struggle to get three, four teams in the, the tournament. And we're talking about yeah, well, a fourteen team league right now. Yeah, and, and the the well, the good thing about the SEC this year is they are terrible. But everybody else is terrible. The bubble is so weak, it's not even funny. So if you look around the SEC, you got four teams that are going. You got Kentucky, and you got Missouri, and you got Florida, and you got Ole Miss. I mean, they're going to the NCAA tournament. But I mean, you got, you know, Alabama was winning, you know, had won four games in a row, and then they lose to Auburn the other night. And Arkansas wins four games in a row, and they're 500 in the league. If you can get one of these other teams, that can kind of get on a streak here because, you know, between – when you take those kind of top four, those, there's about eight of them that are all about the same, um, you know. And if you look at that, you know, right now Alabama has a better uh, SEC record than Missouri. Yeah. Missouri would be all right just because of they, they'll get their guys back. But, um you know, Alabama, I mean, that's a bad loss they had the other night. I mean, they barely even get to 30 points, I think. And then, um, you know, the other one, Georgia. I mean, Georgia's, what, won four in a row. And, um, you know, they kind of get a little bit ahead of steam here. So uh, the problem is, is that you got everybody becoming the number one team in the country and they get their tails kicked. I mean, Indiana gets beat tonight on a last-second shot by Illinois. Um, you know, I mean, it's just one of those things where, it's going to be interesting. I'm actually interested to go to the SEC tournament because I think it'll actually be a good tournament from the standpoint of I think it's going to be pretty competitive outside of Florida. But we'll see. Well, I, I, I want to put Kentucky back up there. I mean, they, they've made huge strides over the last four to six weeks in, in their play uh, and, and their ability to, to finish some games. So, you know, I won't, I won't give it all to Florida just yet. But yeah, well, I, I yeah, I didn't say they're not. But. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem is, is you have Florida do what they did against Arkansas the other night, and it just puzzles you. Um, you know, it's just one of those deals. I think Kentucky, um, I think Kentucky, Missouri, and Ole Miss are kind of fighting for that next level. I mean, Florida, uh, I think is going to pretty much take it, but Kentucky struggles too much with the with the point guard play, but. They've got a guy that just erases everything. And, you know, I mean, and then they have a good game against Ole Miss. You know, they came and played in Poitras and Wiltshire when they can get, you know, assertive um, and Goodwin can stay under control. They're good. Yeah, really good. Three guys there that can be inconsistent. And if you can get those guys uh, all on somewhat of the same – I'll just say the same chapter. They don't even have to be on the same page. If you get them in the same chapter – um, you know, you've got a Kentucky program that's starting to put things together and play well. But it, it is going to take those type of um, performances against Florida. Uh, I think that uh, even I, <coughs> as bad as Tennessee is, um, I think we still have Tennessee at Knoxville. Is that correct, Drew? Yes. And it's, it's just always been a tough place for Kentucky to play. Um, the good news for Kentucky is that there might be a lot of empty seats and it might be quieter than they're used to. So that might might play well for Kentucky this season. But, uh, you know, that they, they've got a shot. They've got, um, you know, if they can split against Florida, uh, I think they've got South Carolina still uh, one more time. Uh, they can pull that off. They've got some, some you know, some good, some good chances there to, to finish that season strong and, and, you know, be where they need to be come March. So, and, and I'm, I'll bring it back around to football. You know, I'll take a top 30 uh, for Kentucky. <laughs> you talk about a program that last year, and, and 
And I want to rebut a little bit, I mean, because it can be done in just a year or, or a couple months. I mean, you look at a Kentucky program, last year they were in the 60s. I mean, I think they were 60th in the rankings uh, to turn around and get, you know, top 28 in one, one of them. And the composite, I think, the 24-7 composite, I'm like you, Blair. I really like how they, they compare all of them and bring them together. They're, they're inside the top 30 uh, for a football program that was struggling to be in the top 60 last year. Uh, a coach that came in, you know, with just a, a month or two himself to, to make some headway into the, the recruiting arena. Uh, you know, it doesn't take that long to, to make some of those huge strides. And, you know, 13th in the SEC out of 14 teams is, is not anything to shake a stick at. But, you know, you compare that statistic. I saw um, Kentucky's recruiting class was, I think, better than five other conferences' top um uh, teams, yeah. You know, you, you look at that, and, and like all but two of the Big Ten. Uh, so you, you take that, and you look at at how that compares to everybody else in the country. You know, it just says how strong the competition is a in the SEC, and b how level uh, that playing field is. Um, and and you know, the other thing is we, how many of these three star players that all these programs have could really be a four star player if they were were graded differently and and it's that i think over the last two or three years that that number's gotten better um, because there's so many sites out there with 247 and rivals and espn putting so much weight into this recruiting uh you're not going to get as many sleepers but i mean mississippi state stole one um, yeah. and, and that was only because they were able to realize that talent before everybody else was uh have that conversation with him early stick with him uh, and, and that's what won that, you know, that recruiting battle. And so there's still a few of those players out there. Uh, you know, I mean, rivals and rivals. I think is the one that today admitted that you know they totally missed their grade on on Manziel. And so you know you still have those opportunities out there to find that right person and <coughs> not grade it as well in these rankings, but still be uh, somebody that can carry your team. So. Anything there? Is it? You all agree with me so much that there's silence on the other end? Is that what it is? That's exactly right, man. I think I think Mark Stoops did excellent work. I mean, I think he I think he attacked it smarter than a lot of people do at Kentucky. He went into Ohio, got into that Midwest, and went and competed against Big Ten teams instead of SEC teams. And then instead of going into Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana, he drove down and uh, dipped into Florida, where he's from. You know, got I think seven or eight kids from there, so um, I think it's a pretty good strategy from that standpoint of um, you know deals. And it's pretty interesting, you know, because it's interesting to watch classes and watch other teams because I followed a lot. I mean, I watched Auburn and kind of what they did, kind of paid attention to Alabama. One of the things that's interesting about Mississippi State is Dan Mullen's mantra is, is basically dominate in state. And this year we had 13 kids from outside the state. That we signed, we only signed eight kids from the from Mississippi. Um, and his whole reasoning behind it was the in-school states are more competitive now about it, um, about the in-state cool kids. But our profile has risen in the four years that he's been there to where people know about Mississippi State, um, you know, across the southeast, and it's more of a brand name to them. Yeah, um, and so now you can go get that kid that. Um, you know, we flip a four-star wide receiver out of Tyler, Texas, that's committed to Oklahoma State for 10 months, yeah, and he flips. It doesn't do you any good to win the state if it's all three-star players. Right. You know, I mean, that, that's great to say you won the state, but, you know, if you get if it's all three and one or two four-star players because of that, and you've left all those other players out there, those, some of those four and a possible five-star player in another state, you've done yourself a disservice. But – yeah, yeah. You know, and I think I think that's oh excuse me, but I, I think that's the thing that Tennessee um, has got to build on. I think I think I think there's more quality. I think there's ten, eleven, twelve kids that are in the state of Tennessee that can play at Tennessee or should be able to play in the SEC. And I think Tennessee's got to dominate that. I mean, Vanderbilt is there, but. You know, you got to be able to go into Memphis, and you got to be able to go into Nashville. You got to be able to get those kids, and um, 
And I think Jones is is really made an, a concerted effort. I mean, I've heard him more on the radio in Nashville than I heard any time of Fulmer in his last three years or even um, Derek Dooley the three years he was there. I mean, they just they made bad mistakes with trying to co communicate with the rest of the state um, and, and just kind of hovered in that East Tennessee world, and um, I think they're opening up to that. And I think Tennessee's making a huge effort in that. I mean, the way I understand it, he's got all his assistants have a, a portion of the state of Tennessee that they have to recruit in now. So, you know, I think that that battle is going to be fought, and I think Tennessee's going to win a lot of those battles because of that. Um, that, that extra attention that's going to be given inside the state. I mean, Stoops proved that in Kentucky by stealing Hatcher away from USC and Louisville. I mean, look, granted, Louisville wasn't much of the conversation, but, I mean, that's his home city. Um, and to have a program like Louisville in your backyard and not be, you know, basically heavily recruited for them, um, you know, that that's what you're going to have to do is find those, those best prospects inside the state and keep a few of those and then get – get the rest from the other states that's the only way you're going to do it if you're a tennessee or mississippi uh, a kentucky even missouri for that matter i mean you're not going to have just you're not going to have a ton of programs coming to your state to recruit those players so you know it, it makes it easier to get those yeah i mean i think that's part of it i think the other part too and i've said it before is tennessee's big thing is they got to win some games on the field yeah. you know you, you lose seven games I think three out of the last four years, or maybe four out of the last five years, you know, you're just not gonna. It's gonna. It's it's a much tougher sell when you've lost that many games, and and it'll come. I mean, it's just they just need to see those wins. They need to, you know, they need to beat Alabama on that last second field goal when Kiffin was there. They need to not have you know 15 guys on the field against LSU at LSU, and they need to not you know not be screwed by, a, a, you know, a rule in the Music City Bowl. So, I mean, they just need to have some of those things happen for them. They have a game uh, they don't let a wide receiver play quarterback and beat you. Well, no, that, yeah. that was actually good. They should have gotten duly fired a year before, but for some reason they let him stay, so. Yeah, you also uh, don't need to start the year at Oregon and at Florida your second and third game, so. I mean, that sucks. Not, not much you can do. You got to play Florida every year. You got to play Georgia every year. You got to play Alabama every year. You got to play South Carolina every year. That's just that's a tough start. I mean, that's that's yeah, just that's that's their schedule. That's what they get every year. Fortunately, everybody has that. I mean, Kentucky has those same teams. They have to play. They don't play Alabama every year. No, they play Mississippi <laughs> State. So. Yeah. Let me roll off Mississippi State schedule. That's a big. That's a big difference. Uh, Mississippi State has Arkansas, Alabama, LSU every year. So I mean, we all every team in the yeah. I mean, that, that's that's a great point, but we all face that same battle. No, no, okay. not everybody doesn't play Alabama every year and the East. I'm telling you, I mean, it's a big, it's a big deal. Yeah, you do. I mean, but who's your who's your uh, who's your East rival? Player, who's Mississippi State's East rival? Well, the East is going to be uh, Kentucky, but we pick up South Carolina at South Carolina this year. Yeah, this year we're playing. Exactly. We're I'm playing. Saying, I'm saying we're playing Oklahoma State the first game of the year in Houston at Reliance unless, Stadium. Unless, unless you, unless you're playing, the East and the West are, are fairly similar. Yes, the last couple years, uh, the West has been a little bit better having Alabama and and LSU, but and Texas A and M. And, and, and yeah, well, this is one year to have Texas A and M, yes, but I'm just telling you, there's a difference in Georgia has not had the same tough schedule Tennessee has. Yeah, but Georgia's not Tennessee. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know. He's, I'm just laughing at, at Shane's like grin. Well, He's I'm got like this big. Uh, uh, I'm trying to screw with uh, uh, Drew Graham on his face. Well, uh, maybe a little bit, but yeah, I mean Georgia has it. Georgia's had the worst one. I mean South Carolina's had a worse schedule than Tennessee for the last two years. They've had you know, last year they had to play two years ago they had to play everybody but LSU, and then last year they had to play everybody but Arkansas. I mean, who was your other West opponent this year, Drew? Mississippi State. <laughs> And and what about this upcoming season? Who who is it? Do you know? Um, I I don't know that, I don't know who that is. 
probably like LSU and Texas A&M like combined just a split squad game. <laughs> Maybe Arkansas. I don't know if that's right. But so you're giving. I mean, who is your other miss? Who's your other East pro- program player? Mississippi State's other East besides Kentucky this next year. Next year we play at South Carolina. So I mean, you know, if you want to make cases, I mean, a lot more know. difficult than Tennessee at home this past year. I mean. It's a it's a totally different deal. Like, like I mean, not not being trying to be mean to Drew. I don't want to go to South Carolina and play with Jaden on Clowney, basically killing our quarterback. I mean, if you take Tennessee's team last year, I'll take that game and start well any time than I'll ever go to freaking Columbia. Uh, I, you're 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 looking at the last couple years history. I mean. Maybe maybe last year, but not. I, I don't know. I, I'm not saying I'm not saying that that anybody in the SEC has it easy. I'm just telling you, if you're in the East and your full time every year rival is Alabama, that's the worst case scenario. <laughs> it is. Yeah, but I mean, it doesn't mean. And if you had going to Oregon on top of yeah, it, I'll, yes. I'll, you want to get into schedules? I'm telling you, you know, you pick any team in the country. I'll go head to head and say Tennessee's got a tough, as tough a schedule as anybody. Oh, man. But that's Tennessee's own fault. I mean, they should just get out of the SEC then if they can't play it. I guess. Well, they they can't balance a checkbook up there either. Oh. Well, no, that's the problem. Is for some reason Tennessee has a president that thinks the most important thing is giving back to academics, and I mean that was a problem. Is Tennessee's? It's not that they didn't make any money. I mean, they didn't make as much money, but they're giving $16 million to the academics. Nobody else does that. Yeah. Just let's quit doing that. The academics should be given the football team. <laughs> make me, I'm telling you, I've already said this, make me the athletic director or give me, you know, the athletic director of Tennessee. Tomorrow I announced that Bruce Pearl will be coming back as coach as soon as his three-year show cause is up. And I, I, my very first phone call is to Nick Saban and say, you know, Coach Saban, how does five years, one hundred million dollars sound? <laughs> and I guarantee you, I can get, I can get a hundred thousand Tennessee fans to donate a thousand dollars to my, to my uh, athletic fund to be able to do that. And academics wouldn't have to pay a penny, would they? That, not, not a single one. And you'd make up your concessions and be able to pay. I, that and in and in three years, I'll pay back. I'll pay you back. I'll I'll pay that money back to you. You get fifty percent of whatever we make more than uh than we've made over the last three years, and you'd make it up. I know it sounds ridiculous, but I'm that's that's where I, well, I mean to do right now. Well, guys, you you remember when Alabama hired him and paid him four million dollars, and everybody thought he was crazy. And, yeah, exactly. And now there's seventy five plus million in the. Reserves, it, it, it paid itself. I agree. Got to be forward thinking. You can't just sit there and be reactive. You know, you got to be proactive in in this in this game. So, if Saban's off the table two years from now, what's going to happen with with your coaching situation? I mean, I'm sure Tennessee will be hiring a new one here in about three years. So that's kind of our <laughs> mo the last few few years. I love it, man. You're not a very happy guy, are you? Whoa, you I'm just telling you, man. Give me something to be excited about as a Tennessee fan. You got to get another quarterback, right? Our our women's basketball coach. Oh, no, never mind. The winningest, you know, the winningest basketball coach uh, in the history of men's or women's basketball has, you know, early onset dementia, you know, and has to retire 15 years too early. Uh, that's another, another, you know, not obviously not making light of that. Just saying that's another. While you're down, right? It just it sucks to be a Tennessee fan. <laughs> well, I tell you what, um, I'm really excited about baseball starting. I don't know about y'all, but <laughs> they do they still play baseball in college? Oh yeah, man. That's like next week. It's just yeah, heck yeah, man. They using metal bats still, Blair? Yes, they're using metal bats. I'm they're, still not watching them. They're uh, they're they're less uh, buoyant, I guess you could say. They don't have the ping that they used to have. Why don't they just switch to wood bats? I have no idea. I, I don't have no. I have no idea either. Wood bats and steroids for everybody. Yeah, that would make it better. 
All I know is I saw that they had duty grow this week, and so I was like, oh, it's baseball time. we got a terrible basketball team. Let's go. Hmm. Let's go. Let's go for the College World Series. Get back there where we belong. When was the last time Mississippi State made it to the College World Series? Like 07. That's not that long. Nah. It's pretty consistent. We do it a lot. I thought it was when Just Will saying. Clark was there. Hmm? I thought it was back when, like, Will Clark was there. Yeah, man. Ron Polk took us there, gosh, forever, you know? But, uh, yeah, Raphael, Palmero, Will Clark, Bobby Thigpen, Jeff Brantley. That was a terrible team. Mm. Would you think Palmero was juicing when he was back at uh, when he was at uh, Mississippi State? I don't think he was, but uh, him and Will Clark had a falling out about five years into their professional career, and I think it. I think we all know what that had to do with because I can think we can all say that Will Clark was a pretty natural athlete because he lasted about seven years and fell apart like most people do. And Will, you know, Palmero went went on for. 500 home runs and 3,000 hits and in, in the Hall of Fame. And a finger wag. Yeah. <laughs> so. I have never taken any performance-enhancing drugs except when I was shot up with a – somebody told me it was a, what, a B12 shot? Yeah. <laughs> hey, man, I mean, he gave us $12 million to build a nice indoor baseball and football facility. So, so what do you cool. care? You're fine with it, right? Yeah, it's the Palmero Center, man. <laughs> they still have his name on it? Oh, yeah. I love it. He still gave the money. They're not going to take it. I mean, are they going to give it back to him to take his name off? I don't know. I bet if they had a Lance Armstrong Center, they'd change the name. Yeah, probably. Maybe. So. But, hey, guys. Yeah, we need to go see some baseball, man. If you can get the same hookup we had last time, you name the time. Pretty awesome, man. There ain't a better place to see college baseball. Yeah, that don't you, like, you sit like in the middle of the outfield, don't you? Yeah, yeah. man. Left field lounge. <laughs> With a cooler and a, a fridge basically behind you behind you, and a grill right in front of you. And yeah. beautiful ladies on either side. So it, it was a horrible way to watch a baseball game. I will say that. It's awesome. All right, guys. Well, I think we're running out of things to say here. Let's let's ra wrap this thing up with some open mics. Drew, you you got anything else you want to vent or tell us about? <laughs> I I could tell you, I could tell you a lot of stuff, but I'll, I'll uh, I'm gonna save the the personal stuff for for a later time when I can uh, say more cuss words, I guess. Um, no, I mean I, I'm excited about uh, I'm excited about spring break coming up. Uh, this uh, I'm, a, I'm a school teacher now, so that's what I look forward to, and I'm looking forward to summer break as well. Uh, this is going to be the summer of Drew again. <laughs> be, uh, I'll be taking many trips. I'll, I'll, I'm planning on going to the beach a couple times. Who knows? Might might head out to the College World Series. You never know. I got the freedom to do it. Going to go to Cedar Point, I believe. Let's go to Wrigley. Yeah, I, I'm in for that. I'm in for whatever. Any, you know, just a random Thursday. Somebody says, "Hey, we're thinking about a trip to Wrigley." Islands. Okay. That's my gonna be my answer. I'm gonna say yes. I'm gonna be like uh, Jim Carrey in Yes Man or whatever. I'm gonna say yes to everything. Hey, you wanna go skydiving today? Yeah, I don't know. nothing else to do. So that's my plan. Uh, I'm pumped about that. Uh, Southwest has a really good deal right now on flights. You can go. Uh, so in the next couple of days is when you need to be booking your flights if you're wanting to travel somewhere. I think it's like forty nine dollars anywhere within five hundred miles or something, and like ninety nine dollars anything within a thousand miles. So. Book a flight somewhere and and get excited, man. That's huge. That's that's a big deal. Yeah, it's a good it's a good deal. It's like a Valentine's Day deal, but it's only like the next two days. So, you know, if anybody wants to do that, but you can follow me at uh, Drew Young twenty on Twitter. Um, that's all I got. All right, Blair, you got anything? I do. I got um. I'm gonna piggyback on uh, Drew's hatred for 3D movies. Um. <laughs> Because my wife, uh, a couple Saturdays ago, um, Bennett wanted to see Monsters, Inc. So she said it was showing at uh, Cool Springs. I was like, sure, we'll go do that. Catch a nooner, you know. And uh, <laughs> and uh, so, uh, yeah, we get there, and it's a 3D movie, which we didn't know. Uh, we weren't really paying attention. So it was thirteen fifty a piece for Sarah and I, $13 for Bennett. 
And of course, we had popcorn. A, fifth, a fifty cent uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> reduction for reduction the price. That, that makes sense. Yeah, that should be illegal, man. I don't. I don't a understand three D of... movies. It's like let's let's make the experience less enjoyable what and you know? charge more. Yeah, it was like seventy five dollars <laughs> for <laughs> us to go see the movies. It was like uh, twenty. I think it was twenty-five dollars for the yeah, sixty-five bucks. Twenty-five dollars for a medium popcorn and two medium drinks and a snack pack for a kid, and then forty dollars to see the movie. I mean, my face was boiling. It does. It doesn't make any sense. I'm telling you, three D makes no sense. It's this is a movie that's been out for what, fifteen years. That's the funny thing too is you paid you paid sixty five dollars for something that you could have honestly gone to a red box, got it for ninety nine cents, bought bought a bag of Orville Redenbacher's uh, you know, three pack of popcorn for two ninety nine, and got you a big K cola for ninety nine cents, you're you're out the door for six bucks. <laughs> and you spent sixty. I'm and you, you wouldn't have had to watch it in stupid three D. Well, I, you could have probably bought it on bought it on Amazon for what you paid for one ticket. Have, have any of y'all seen the uh, the what is it Zero Dark Thirty? I'd like to see it. I've never seen it. No, I seen saw it. it. It's good. Good movie. It yeah. It was uh it was long. It was two hours and forty minutes. Um, but it was two hours of kind of a build up to kind of what actually happened. So it it was pretty good. What's the point? At, at what point will, will y'all quit going to the movie because it's too expensive? I remember when tickets used to be like seven bucks, and they went to seven fifty, and then there was a big jump to like nine dollars. And we were like, if it ever gets over ten, screw this, we're not going anymore. And then it gets to ten, and then of course now they're just like, damn, these yeah. guys are paying ten bucks. Let's charge them thirteen. You know. So Dude, what's the what's the price? I mean, the problem is, I don't go to a lot of movies to begin with, but it's, I mean. Dude, I remember going and seeing Rocky Four when I was like, ten or whenever it was, with my cousins in Atlanta, Georgia, and it was like seven dollars, which was insane then. Was that Tommy, you know? Tommy Gunn. Yeah, that was the AIDS-riddled Tommy Gunn. Yeah, and so it was just it was kind of crazy, but I don't know, man. I mean, I don't go to a lot of movies, and after that experience, I sure as heck won't be going to do. Any of that crap anymore? That's for sure. My thought is, I just pull a Drew and get it for half price because I just go to two movies. That, yeah. I mean, if you, you need to go to about four movies now. Wait. Yeah. If you catch a Drew double feature, I mean, thirteen fifty—that's what six and a quarter a movie, six seventy-five a movie. That's not bad. Yeah. Uh, it, it is. It's just to the point where it's just—it's ridiculous. I mean, what what is it though, Shane? If you you go to the movie every once in a while, right? Uh, if it's a kids' movie, I take my my daughter. Yeah. You you and Haley never go to the movie just on a date or anything like that. Mm -hmm. What's a date? Yeah. Where you go out with adults and spend time. Yeah. Like leave the that kids never happens. I have no idea what you're talking about. Y'all y'all are that's your problem. I mean, that's twenty bucks. Problem. Are you gonna just quit? Are you what twenty? Would you pay twenty to get in, or would you just say no? Nope, sorry, sorry, uh, Bennett. We we can't we can't let you go see this. Pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Got to be a call. I'll say, I'll go. Hey, dude, you want to watch the Jungle Book on the computer? He's like, Yeah. He doesn't care anyway. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. Just give him your iPad and yeah. Yeah. have a ball. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There's probably going to come a point, but at that point, you know, the kids are going to be older, and you're going to you're going to want to go see the movie too. So, you know, I'm just sitting there going, Hey, dude, what if you're what if you have a kid right now that's 16 years old and he's trying to take a girl out on a date? You got. You can give him a hundred dollars, and he's he's not gonna have enough money. Go out to you know. You just need murder. to go buy. You need to go buy him a box of condoms and tell him to go to a church parking lot somewhere. Give him, give him your Hilton Honors Rewards card. Yeah, exactly. I got some Hilton points you could borrow. That's exactly what you need. Double bag it up. You know, <laughs> be sure. Here's four dollars. Go buy you some Trojans. <laughs> Go buy you some. Go buy you some. Uh, some Boone's Farm. <laughs> you know, a pack of Black and Mild. <laughs> Black and Mild is what you say. Yeah, and a box of a box of condoms, and go and go have fun. That's it. 
That's a, that's that's the idea. That's what you need to do, guys. Yeah, I know. I know Drew's got kids. After that, is that not a good parenting technique, or uh, depends on who you ask. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's cheaper. Less mistakes, right? <laughs> you're teaching. You're you're just uh, you're just help, helping them make smart decisions. By they're going to make that decision anyway, Shane. You just you just make that decision smarter. You can regulate it. It's like legalizing. Uh, it's like legalizing marijuana and gambling and stuff like that. Speaking of that, are we ready they're going to do it anyway. You might as well regulate it. We ready to move to Colorado or uh, was it Washington? Yeah, State? both of those. Both of those states legalize it. Legalize, and, and I didn't realize that till just recently that they didn't just legalize it, but they legalized recreational use. Yeah. yeah. So, good for them. I mean, that could solve a lot of tax issues. I mean, we. Heck we, yeah. We want to I say just tax the hell out of it. Make it legal with taxes. I mean, tax it like cigarettes. I mean, how anybody could still smoke and pay for it? I have no idea. That's what that's what cracks me up is you've got all these poor people that are smoking still, and it's like four dollars a pack. <laughs> Yeah, and that's for the cheap generics. Too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's for some some Paul Malls. <laughs> some some camels. American cut. No, like camels. You're smoke a camel. You better be a millionaire. Oh no, man. American Century or something like that. <laughs> American Century. American Spirit. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but some some Durals. <laughs> the one tens or the one twenties. Yeah. I mean, when are we going to When are we going to the new brewery over there at? Uh, Cool Springs, Granite. Granite City. Yeah, man. Now open, ready to go. Maybe we I got. I got to go fill up my uh, Cool Springs Brewery uh, growler tomorrow maybe for the we, weekend. Maybe we, maybe we can talk them into letting us do a remote from there. How's that? That'd be awesome. Uh, quick quick we shout got, out. To we you. have great content. Yeah. Quick shout out to McDougal's Chicken in Nolensville opening up on Sunday. Nice because they shut down in Cool Springs. I know. I can't wait. I'm I'm putting on a hundred pounds. I hate McDougal's. That stuff's good. It's terrible. Uh, it was it was good when they gave you free sauce. They still give you free sauce. They just don't let you pump it yourself. You can go get yeah. as much as you want up there. Yeah. You just it's, feel bad about saying, "Can I have seven honeybee sauces or whatever?" <laughs> you used to be able to. That was what's bad is when I would when I could pump a sauce myself, I would get like I would get like twenty different sauces. You know, like. You know, and not feel bad. But now you got to ask for it. So, yeah, I mean, for those that, that have no idea what McDougal's is, it's a you know chicken finger joint, and and just like the McDonald's ketchup dispenser that you get to pump, they had what twenty different types of sauces basically. Yeah. Just sat out there for your just enjoyment, and so mix and match, and you know get tired of one, go get another kind of thing. And it was great. And then they they put them, they pulled them behind the counter. It's kind of like the you know Playboys when you were younger. They used to be. You know, up, up, up there, so you could peruse them. Now they, then they put them behind the counter, so you put them in plastic, plastic, man. Right. All right. Yeah. We're gonna end it on this one. What do you think? I don't know. I want to. I want to hear more of Drew's uh, church uh, parking lot stories. <laughs> uh, that's for the next podcast. All right. With that, we're gonna call this podcast done. <laughs>